before that, a message from your friends at the Lightning Junkies podcast. We like to keep our podcasts ad free, but we like to make sure Cat gets paid. So we would really appreciate if you support any of the supporters that you can find at lightningjunkies.net forward slash support, as well as listening to us on Breeze. Fountain, or any of the other value-for-value value apps you can find at newpodcastapps.com. Beyond listing our supporters, you can also go to lightningjunkies.net forward slash support to find other ways to support us here at the podcast, including paying us Bitcoin and Bitcoin over the Lightning Network. Help keep this podcast ad free by supporting us today. Now on with the show. This is the Lightning Junkies podcast with your host, Chaz. On this week's episode of the podcast, we have Andre and Fiat Jaff, and we're talking about lightning addresses going to the fucking moon. Could you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves today? How are you guys doing? Hey, Chaz. Thanks for having us. This is Andre, CTO and co-founder at Zebedee. Hey, thank you. Uh, this is Fiat Jaff. I do programming stuff. That's it. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, I'm I'm really glad to have you guys on here. Quick little background: uh, when I first heard about Lightning Address, I was uh, very skeptical. If, if if Andre remembers, I was like almost immediately talking shit about it. The reason for that, I think, to kind of defend myself slightly here, is it really reminded me of a lot of like older projects that people might be familiar with that were on Bitcoin that tried to do the similar kind of alias. Um, like aliasing thing and you know something like netkey which is i guess is still around for whatever reason and uh one name which later became uh block stack i have very negative thought process on those projects oh you can also bring in like something like the ens like the ethereum thing whatever obviously not on bitcoin i built up a very skeptical view of all that I'm probably wrong. I have, I'm skeptical about a lot of things that I'm probably wrong about. But um, after a while, after noticing like pretty much all the wallets <laughs> adopting a lightning address, I you know had to admit to myself, okay, Chaz is probably wrong about this. It's probably a positive thing overall. That's why I'm you know bringing you guys on here to kind of school me and school other people because it does seem like this whole project is very important. I might have some misgivings still, but I think we can get into those in the podcast here. But um, here, here's the but. I, I do want to take a step back here before we actually launch into Lightning Address and all the good stuff, because I kind of want to learn more about Andre here. You know, everyone knows Fiat Jaff. He's been on the show before, so we kind of have an idea of his background. But I was kind of interested in uh, your background, Andre, and how you kind of got into Bitcoin and Lightning. From there, we'll kind of touch on to Zebedee and Mint Gox, but I'm just kind of interested in your origin story, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I'm not as famous on Twitter as Fiat Jaff is. Uh, a lot of you may not know me. So my, my story is actually quite simple. I had a, a very close friend of mine who was very into Ethereum uh, back in the day and participated in the ICO, and um, he was a, vi a very big proponent of NEO. I don't know if you guys remember that one. It was like rebranded multiple times. It was, I think it was the, the marketing was like the Chinese killer of Ethereum, right? That was the, the marketing at the time. Made a buttload of money on that. And then he was also one of the, I believe, founding engineers of MakerDAO. Um, and he was just in general very versed in that world. I, I never kind of, you know, got into that side. I, I immediately decided to read upon Bitcoin and I read the white paper. Uh, I can say it didn't click at first, uh, as it doesn't with most people. Uh, but then, you know, I read it again and again, and I picked up some books uh, and sort of sparked that interest. Just like everyone, you, you go down this path of reading some white papers and trying to understand all the, the nuances and cryptographic schemes of all the different assets and coins and so forth. Uh, but I got delusioned very quickly, uh, disillusioned very quickly, because uh, it just seemed like a bunch of 
um, you know, big brains put together to create very complex white papers to sell something that actually didn't have much merit. Um, so Bitcoin actually stroked my fancy much more. I guess jumping forward a little bit, uh, my, my entrance into to Lightning uh, was in 2018 when I was invited to participate in the very first Lightning Network residency program from the Chain Code Labs folks uh, in New York. Um, so it was a group of 10 of us. And it was actually pretty cool because if you look back at it, um, I, I just looked back and tried to name the people that were in the room. Um, we've got Willow Byrne from Jewel. Jewel was created at, in that residency program. Kara Shard, who's now, you know, leading Kraken and Bitcoin projects. Uh, Rene Picard, who's, who's writing the Lightning Network book with Andreas and, and, uh, Lalu. Uh, you got Alekos, uh, from the Bitcoin dev kit. Um, and then you've got the, the folks that were sort of teaching us this stuff at the residency. You got, you know, Christian Decker from Rockstream. You got Alex Bosworth from Lightning Labs. Jack Mallers was there talking about Zap, Chris Stewart from Shirtbit. So it was literally everyone. And, and, you know, that's now leading a bunch of fronts on the Lightning Network space. From then on, I actually uh, engaged with uh, Lightning Koala quite heavily. He was also there. Um, and we decided, I don't know if you remember around these times is when Lightning Chess came around. So him and I got together to create the Koala Studio project. Uh, and we built Lightning Chess, which was, you know, a chess game, which had Lightning network capabilities, um, which was pretty cool. And it was a great proof of concept. And then in a future life, uh, I, I went ahead and met up with Simon Cowell and Christian Moss, who are my co-founders at Zebedee. Uh, and we sort of spun off and, and we now have a team of, of 30 people spread around the world. Obviously, you kind of got into the kind of lightning with the fire hose there. I mean, you know, maybe one of the, the better places to, to really get started on lightning is with Chain Code Labs. I think you're listing a lot of the names there and other people that went to different um, different periods of time uh, ended up doing amazing things and ended up, you know, on the show and, you know, doing different projects. So it's it's really interesting to know that you're yet another person who got their start at uh, Chain Code. A lot of these people were were the ones who were writing the actual specifications, right, and who were writing the first implementations of of Lightning Node. So, I guess it's it's the cream of the crop, right? Whatever the expression is. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, kind of thereafter, you met Simon and Christian, and you kind of created Zebedee. Um, could you kind of let me know, like, what Zebedee is, and maybe what the the inspiration was to create the company. Obviously, it's a lightning gaming company, but I feel like it's a bit more than that. Yeah, totally. I think uh, it's it's quite uh, you know small to say lightning gaming. Uh, to be honest, we see ourselves as fintech uh, infrastructure provider for the gaming industry, providing very specific uh, payments infrastructure around Bitcoin uh, and Lightning. Right, so we. We are targeting the gaming industry because it is an industry that is uh, is very prone to accepting a technology like this. Uh, you know, the audience is, uh, the, I guess, the demographics are much younger. It's it's a, a younger demographic that is is tech savvy. They're closer to computers. They understand digital values. They under understand rewards and points and in game economies. This is all you know already part of their life. And and we think there's. Uh, a lot of capabilities that specifically something like Lightning Network allows you to do. Uh, you basically, you know, we, a lot of people say this, but uh, what the internet did to information, uh, Lightning is effectively trying to do with money, right? Money is now data and you can send it back and forth at extreme speeds uh, with extreme high throughput and, and making hundreds of thousands to millions of transactions on a month, daily, weekly, monthly basis. So there's a lot of open, you know, capabilities here. And I think we're just scratching the surface. You know, touching a little bit on on what we provide uh, as a company, uh, we provide infrastructure. So we're partnering with game developers and game studios who want to introduce this new technology to their games in the form of Bitcoin rewards, in the form of in-game economies, in the form of, you know, uh, sort of ad revenue being sent back to the players. Uh, there's many ways to integrate. It's entirely up to the developers. Uh, so APIs, SDKs, developer dashboards, all of the, the tools needed to, to integrate and monitor your game. And then on the other end, we have tools for gamers. So we, we built a, the Zebedee wallet, right? Which is an easy to use, uh, wallet to get started. And then, uh, that wallet has a ton of integration. So we have a Discord integration. We have a Telegram integration. We have a Steam integration. 
And all of these is essentially to provide uh, the same functionality and the same capability, uh, regardless of where the gamer finds themselves. If you're chatting with your friends and preparing for a guild on Discord, you can just, you know, shoot some stats over, um, you know, with, with text. Um, and if you're outside, you can use the wallet and scan a QR code. So wherever you are, Zebedee is, is sort of with you to provide you that functionality. Going back a little bit on, on what we, uh, you know, how it came about. Um, so it, it's interesting because the three of us, Myself, Simon, and Chris come from uh, slightly different backgrounds, actually quite different backgrounds, um, and it's sort of like the three legs of, of a tripod. <laughs> I don't even know if that's an expression. So Simon comes from the financial uh, services background. Uh, he used to lead, uh, be a, a, an LP at the Oxford Endowment Fund, and later on he uh, joined uh, Bitstamp as head of corporate strategy. Um, and that's where, you know, we, we eventually met. Um, and, uh, Chris is, for those who, who know him for his handle on Twitter, his name is Mandelduck. Uh, he's actually one of the pioneers of Bitcoin gaming. And 2013, I believe, was when he released his first Bitcoin game, which was called Saratobi. Um, and, you know, had integrations with Coinbase and all of that stuff. Uh, unfortunately, he had to shut down all of his games because of scaling issues. And it was paying more to send transactions to players than, you know, to actually send them the reward itself. Um, and then when Lightning came around, that's when it sparked uh, his interest once again. Um, so he comes from the game development. Simon comes from the financial services. And I come from the systems and product development. Uh, so I've been building software for you know, the, the better past decade or so and uh, of all sizes from from tiny MVPs and teams of two people to uh, large scale enterprise software for teams of 10, 20 plus. Um, and we all had very similar ideas around, you know, being able to put lightning network capabilities into games. Uh, you now have the same value you're, you're essentially putting real value inside of the game so whether it's uh, as a point inside of the game or as a, as a real you know in-game economy uh, as a game developer you don't have to now worry about the mechanics around it you can use a real life you know currency the money that exists in the world and that value carries regardless of which game you're in regardless if you're in the real world or, in, or inside of a virtual world like a game um, and we just think that vision is just sort of opening now there's so much more if you, if you extrapolate it into the you know quote-unquote metaverses and the ready player one scenarios we would love for zebedee to be a big platform provider and enabler for a lot of these you know uh, sort of economic applications to occur uh, in, the, in these games and these virtual worlds. So that's a long-winded way of, of going through that. <laughs> no, no, that's a uh, great answer, I think. Um, I kind of want to take the tangent that you kind of gave us there at the end, like this, this, this future of uh, like metaverse, whatever. I, I kind of hate that buzzword to some extent. I hate that word too. <laughs> let's just go with it though um you know let's imagine that there's some like metaverse where we're, we're, we're going into some vr or ar or whatever the case might be and exploring some different world let's say one one criticism would be is i would maybe want to be more sovereign even in that virtual world you know so i might avoid the facebook metaverse for example because they're you know trying to do their thing and that sounds absolutely dreadful Kind of like a weird random question, but, you know, where do you see kind of Zebedee being in that, you know, because as far as I can tell, um, Zebedee is a centralized company. Um, so they're, you know, you kind of have to be kind of careful how you set things up and all that, or else you kind of turn into Facebook on some level of this centralized company doing centralized things with KYC and compliance and da, 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 da. You know, how do you see Zebedee kind of working in that scenario, I guess. T totally. Uh, it's a very common question. Uh, so I think uh, in Bitcoin and, you know, especially in Lightning, the protocol gives you options. Uh, if you're seeking to be an entirely sovereign individual, you have that option and you have software and you have companies providing capabilities for that. If you're seeking, you know, an easy way into a, a, the Lightning Network, you have software and capabilities for that. If you want a hybrid approach where you're using something like Moon or Breeze or Phoenix, which is it's a non-custodial, you're holding keys, but they're providing some services for you, like opening and handling channels, you can use that. So uh, Zebedee is not trying to solve the sovereign individual, hold your keys, uh, you know, be your own, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, sovereign person. 
uh, we, we are not actively trying to solve that. If we were, we would be failing quite, quite bad at that. Um, we are trying to solve uh, the situation of onboarding an entire industry of folks who are not versed in this world. Imagine the experience of someone who has never touched or let's say they have never heard of Bitcoin or anything and they open their wallet for the first time. And the first experience that they see is creating a 24 seed word phrase that they have to write somewhere and keep it for the rest of their life. Uh, that is a very poor experience, right? You can't expect to onboard a billion to two billion gamers uh, over the coming years with this sort of experience. So it's not that we, we as Zebedee discredit that. As individuals, we're all proponents of Bitcoin sovereignty and, and all of that. It's just a matter of how do you onboard the user and then how do you educate them moving forward? So we don't consider a user, a gamer that is onboarded through Zebedee uh, and then decides to have their own node and start using something like Zeus to control his own node and interact with our games as a customer that we have, you know, quote unquote, lost. That's not a lost customer for us. That is someone that we have successfully onboarded and someone that has moved on onto you know their own model their own their, their own things that they want to pursue in their sovereignty aspect um, contrary to a lot of bitcoiners beliefs not everyone wants to hold keys right it's it's not an easy tool it's not an easy thing to just you know get a hardware wallet or keep your seed phrase secret and safe um, so we're trying to onboard gamers and game developers into this world um, and I, I do want to point one thing if you're a game developer at scale, um, and you're a game studio and you're doing, you know, two, three, four, five hundred thousand MAU, monthly active users. Um, you cannot, it, like, it, it's almost beyond your expectation to run your entire payment processing gateway, right? If you're a, a high throughput, uh, high sales throughput company, you're not going to run your own payment gateway. You're going to integrate with something like Stripe. Why? Because they're the experts. They're providing infrastructure. There's 24 seven, you know, support and maintenance and all of that happening. Um, so you worry about your products and your company and they worry about the payment gateway. Uh, we see ourselves in very similar approach. If you're doing an at scale game that has hundreds of thousands of players, you need to have support. You need to have enterprise solutions. And that's what Zebedee is trying to provide on that end. Uh, and for that, we need to be a, a centralized solution in order to provide those services, right, for the game developers. Um, so there are trade-offs uh, and there are many options. You don't have to choose Zebedee for everything. Zebedee serves certain use cases and certain users. Um, and so that's our view into how to onboard the next wave of, you know, there's there's 2.6 billion gamers out in the world. So it's a, it's an uphill battle. It basically sounds like the approach here is one by example. Like even kind of including the lightning address thing, I think it was in the Zebedee wallet first. So would you say of like that's kind of the approach here that like you're going to like eat your own dog food and kind of show the game companies how it's done as like an easier sales pitch, let's say? On the game developer side, I, I would say it's more about the merits of the technology and the capabilities it enables. Um, you know, they would be switching from their current game, uh, game payment provider to switching to Zebedee, right? It would be a switching of APIs or SDKs or something. So on the game developer, I actually think it's more on that side. On the gamer, gamer side, it's very much a, you know, get started easy. Here's a one button sign up. Um, but you don't need to stay here. We want you to stay, of course, because we want you to have the best experience with the Zebedee powered games. Uh, but you can, it's, we consume and interact with an open standard. So anyone that speaks that standard can take advantage of that. So, um, you know, to your point, we, we see it as a great onboarding tool. And if users want to edu you know, get more educated and, and learn to use their own software, like I said, like that is a bonus and that is, is, a, is a benefit. Like we see that as a positive thing. With the um, Infuse product, I believe the first or one of the first, I'll say, um, games to, in to get integrated with that is CSGO. It seems likely to me that CSGO was picked because um, I believe it's open source. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, if it's not open, then it's like very nearly open from Valve, I think. It's still popular all these, these years later. Is that vaguely correct why CSGO was picked? I can speak a little bit and then I'd love to get a few Jeff's take. Uh, CSGO was picked for two reasons. One is uh, it's not open source, but it is very moddable. CSGO itself was a mod of Half-Life before. Um, so it's just, you know, something that it's it's part of the gaming ecosystem of, of Valve and CSGO that you can run your own servers, you can write your own plugins, and you can basically get any data from a server. 
Um, so there's tons and tons of mods. And so it made sense for us to do that first. Um, but second, it was just, you know, Infuse was actually, uh, the inception and invention of Infuse, uh, was actually Mendel Duck, uh, Chris Wu was, uh, drinking some, I believe it was Infused whiskey or Infused rum one night and on Friday. And we were discussing this and that. And, and on the next Monday, he showed up and said, Hey, I put Bitcoin into CSGO. Um, but definitely it was because it, it's still, you know, the top leading FPS game, especially when it comes to esports. And there's 20 plus million active players in the world. So it just made sense to target that first. The user base is there and it seems like the right move. Fiojaf was actually very involved in building parts of CSGO integration. So I don't know if he has any thoughts on it. I don't know what, like, what was the plan for Infuse exactly from the company perspective, but I see it as, I saw it as a, a hack to get people to see Satoshi's taking part in games and that's it. But I, I don't think that's like the, the ultimate goal of the, of the company is to, to make hacks on games that, and introduce Satoshi's on them. I would second that just to, to clarify. So we see Infuse and CSGO as a way to, you know, it's one thing when you're opening the, the conversation with a AAA studio uh, and you're showing them indie games, right? It's a, it's a sort of a d different conversation. And then when you show them uh, CSGO integrated with Bitcoin, you know, your eyes go wide open. Um, so it is, it is a uh, proof of concepts to showcase to larger studios, you know, look, this is what it can be. Um, but it has taken a life of its own. And now we're doing hundreds of matches every day and people are playing every single day nonstop and we have plenty of servers. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's only growing. We have more games coming for that. Um, and we have a bunch of game developers building with, with Zebedee at the moment. So um, do you have any kind of numbers to share on that? I'm just kind of curious how many people were playing. I mean, obviously zero were playing at the beginning, but like how many people are playing C like this version of CSGO at this point? Looking at like data that I have in front of me right now, actually, um, I believe we're doing anywhere from 180 to 250 CSGO matches a day. Um, and this can vary. Uh, so this can, you know, matches can go from eight to 15 minutes, um, potentially a little more. And we have three game modes. So we've got, uh, a competitive survival and deathmatch. So, uh, you know, lots of maps and, and lots of players, I, tens of thousands of players. Uh, I, I don't have in front of me, a, you know, the number of daily active infused users specifically. But that's, a, you know, we're doing hundreds of, of matches a day. And, and every every Friday we have what's known as match time uh, where we, we you know, we, there's a sponsor that is uh, sponsoring all of the servers. So the last one was Bitstamp. The previous one was BitMEX. Um, and essentially they're, you know, they're sort of paying for the entry fees to these servers. Uh, and so all of the players are, are playing nonstop for a good like six hours or so. Uh, and people are cashing out, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of sats. Uh, on any given Friday, and we do this every Friday. So, um, yeah, there, there's an infused leaderboard that's coming out soon, and, and it basically shows the, the most amount of people that have won uh, sats, and some people have won millions of sats. So it's pretty crazy. All right, and so kind of on a similar topic is Mint Gox. That seems kind of more up the kind of let's show them examples kind of thing, get people excited, get them involved kind of thing. Yeah, so Mint Gox was actually a response to the pandemic. Uh, it was March 2020, and we had lots of plans of showing the technology around in all of the gaming conferences, and then the world shut down, and we decided to take things remote and, and virtual. So we partnered with uh, Jack Everett from Thunder Games and Des Desiree Dickerson, um, and we basically built out Mint Gox from scratch. Uh, from the code side, what I like to say is it, it's the longest living hackathon project I've ever had. Uh, it was built in two weeks and we just kept iterating and building and building. Um, you know, and, and so it's sort of again taken a life of its own. Mint Gox is a monthly esports tournament and we host, uh, you know, a, a bunch of uh, folks get together. Um, and we play a bunch of Bitcoin enabled games, Bitcoin powered games, I'd say. And that goes from CSGO to uh, Bitcoin Rally to Rain Up Rumble to Thunder Games is, you know, Turbo 84, uh, you know, Saratobi. And, and there's more, uh, you know, coming out uh, every month, essentially. Um, you know, at some point, we also had Bitcoin Bounty Hunt from, from Donner Lab. Um, so, you know, this is essentially a way for us to begin to create the 
now vibrant Bitcoin gaming sort of community uh, because not only was is lightning new at the time uh you know it was two years old three years old maybe and then bitcoin gaming was new and bitcoin gaming with lightning was super new um so we had to foster a community we had to have live stream we had to show people what is what is actually this this whole bitcoin gaming thing and that's where minkox is and we've done now over 20 i believe of these events and every event we give out um, you know, essentially 10 million sats to, to, to the tournament, uh, participants, uh, to the winners. And so at this point, we've given well over two Bitcoin, um, in Bitcoin 2021 conference in Miami. Uh, Zebedee actually held the Mingox esports arena where we actually held a, a full blown tournaments. Um, you know, we actually had. Uh, Bitcoin companies competing with each other. We had Fold and Lightning Labs and Moon, uh, and and their their employees were competing against each other in CS:GO. Um, and we had a sponsorship from Bitstamp there, which so essentially we gave away a whole Bitcoin at the conference as well. So at this point, we've given out a, a ton of Bitcoin in in, in these games and, and community events. All right. And so how does Lightning Address kind of fit into the mix here? Was that something that was created while, you know, people were working on Zebedee? Or is it something that just came out of left field and was just kind of inserted in, into Zebedee later? Yeah. So I, just to make it very clear, uh, Lightning Address is not something that was uh, created unanimously by Zebedee. And we said, this is what it is. Um, so there's the, there's a LNURL, uh, group in Telegram, um, where we're consistently discussing new ideas, new improvements, new ways where we can introduce improvements to the u- user interface and user flows, uh, as it relates to lightning users and, and, and service providers. Um, and something that has been discussed before was this idea of a, of an identifier, right? Something that, that resembles an identity. It's not trying to be an identity, but something that is able to say, uh, who do I pay to, right? How do I pay? Because in Lightning, as we all know, you need to get an invoice to pay that after. Uh, we can go into certain tangents around uh, key send and so forth. But that aside, um, you know, one day, uh, I want to say it was Fiat Joff, myself, Anton from Simple Bitcoin Wallet, and Hampus from Blix Wallet. We were all discussing this on, on the chat and um, it just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually we spec'd it out. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at the moment, at the time, it was just a PR that we wanted to execute on. And, you know, some of the wallets were saying, okay, let's, let's look into implementing this. Um, but really it was myself and Fiat that took the plunge and said, okay, let's, let's actually like create a website to explain this because I think it, it merits. It's a big, uh, capability. And so over the weekend, I built the lightningaddress.com website, um, and sort of some of the uh, instructional documents and videos and so forth. Um, and then I pushed that out in, in the middle of August. Um, it, to be fair, Zebedee was actually not the first one to implement it. Um, it was, it was LNTX bot and then it was Blix wallet. Um, I think Zebedee was the third or fourth, uh, which was, I, I was kind of sad because I really wanted to be the first one. Well, uh, I think the, the story that Anton wanted to, for some reason, he wanted to pay to an email address. And then we, we were talking to him and saying, no one likes email. Like it's impossible to implement email stuff. Can we use this? as just uh, an identifier that's not that doesn't necessarily have to be an email that turned into the discussion and recited before we go into more of a kind of technical discussion here um just for the listener's benefit how could someone get a lightning address as soon as possible here totally um there's a few ways so lightning address is is a protocol uh you could and there's three ways, essentially. Uh, one is to follow this, this same way that you can self-host an email server yourself. You can self-host a Lightning server yourself, a Lightning address server, sorry. Uh, it's it's akin to an LNURL server. It sits next to your Lightning node or it sits somewhere that can connect to your Lightning node. Um, and all it's doing is requesting invoices from it. Like, hey, someone wants to pay you. Give me an invoice for 500 sats. Great. Um, so you can self-host everything. Uh, you can use what's known as a as a bridge server. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, a server that sits in between your node uh, and you know the the, the address itself. Uh, and so you know, there's a few of them. One of them is the one that I've released. It's called PayAddress.co. And so you can connect your node, you know, with only the invoice macaroon, for example. So I can't 
I can't spend funds. You're not giving control of any funds. You're just essentially saying, these are the directions. If, if someone is trying to pay me, this is how you get an invoice from me. Um, and that's what's known as a bridge server. And there's, pl- there's a few backends you can use, uh, for that. It's not just LND. And then you can go the, the full blown route of, you know, an infrastructure provider. So the same way you want to create an email, you don't roll it out in your, in your home server. You just go to gmail.com and set it up. Um, the easiest way to get it, a lightning address is to go to one of the providers that provide it, you know, out of the box, uh, which is LNTX bot, Zebedee. There's another Telegram bot that does it. Uh, BitRefill just released uh, support for it. Uh, CoinOS has support for it. And there's a few more coming out. So. Um, that would be the easiest way. Just sign up and, and you should have it right off the bat. I think I only saw like a couple of the kind of mobile wallets out there that are one of those hybrid wallets. I think all of them support it now, except for Moon. I think they're still, um, they don't support it quite yet. But it seems like if you're on Breeze or on Phoenix, you should be able to use it. should be able to send to an address, man. I was going to clarify that. Yeah, we're also missing... Strike and Chivo Wallet should be implemented too. A lightning address is just a, an LN URL pay address. So the idea here is that you're paying from a wallet to a service, and that service has may have accounts. And in that case, like in, in most of the lightning address cases, you're paying to an account from someone on a service. And that there's also these host, like self hosted and bridge servers that. Act, act as the same way, like act, act as a service on behalf of, on behalf of the user that is host that is uh, behind that. There's also a, a, an interesting use case that is from the lnurl payme There's a website that that does a bunch of it sells a bunch of service like microservices like filling uh, phones and refilling metro subway cards and other weird stuff on Russia, Ukraine, Nigeria, whatever. It also deposits to Russian accounts, Ukrainian accounts. So you can get an, an, an ID address that is like your account number uh, at the, the bank or the, the country dot lnur slash pay dot me and you can just send money to there and it will arrive in, in your account or it will arrive in your phone on these countries provided it's one of the services they, they cover so that's uh, one interesting use case that is not a user account properly Lightning address kind of strikes me as an interesting um, like upgrade in a certain sense. And um, I appreciate you mentioning uh, Strike Fiat Jaff because I think that's a kind of leads me to an interesting question here. So I think I was pretty disappointed on some level. I mean, there's definitely arguments against my disappointment, but I was disappointed on some level when the 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 tipping that uh, we got on twitter is based on the strike api um you have to be in the us or in el salvador to use it etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it seems like a good amount of people who are, who are, are outside of that kind of fan club there of being able to KYC for Strike and you know use it and sign up on you know their either iphone and put it onto their twitter account etc do you guys think right now that Lightning Address is as accessible as, I mean, obviously it's more accessible in some sense, but just the kind of the knowledge that's required and just the thought process is required. Do you think most people putting up a Lightning Address on their, or on their Twitter profile is worth it? You know, it's like going through the, the steps or is anyone going to tip them, et cetera, et cetera. I personally don't think tipping is a big use case for money, but apparently everybody ag- like disagrees with me. Most people think tipping is very good, cool, and so on. But yeah, I, when 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 Twitter said they were going to integrate Lightning, I think we all thought Lightning address would be a, a a nice fit for it. But of course, we didn't believe Twitter would uh, implement that. <laughs> but I think it would fit very nicely, because mostly because it's an open environment. Like everybody can, like anyone can host uh, its own their own their own their own thing. Or there are multiple providers offering accounts with Lightning addresses. So it's like it is strictly better than just Strike. Like, there's no 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 way to argue with that. 
I would say it's it's less about which provider is the one that Twitter chose, and it's more about choosing a proprietary API. Um, when in a near future, everything will have lightning in, in it, right? Like every service, every, every game, every app, every, everything will have lightning in it very soon because it's, it's going, it's the money of the internet at the very least. So, um, in a world where every service has it, every account has lightning and so on, you don't want Twitter likely doesn't want to implement hundreds of proprietary APIs for something that is as basic as give me an invoice. Right. You would love to see uh, Twitter adopting a standard, which is the, something like the LNURL pay standard and the lightning address standard uh, that could essentially allow for them to support multiple providers at once and say, look, we are just supporting the email protocol. Right. We are just supporting the lightning address protocol. If you have a lightning address, you can put it here and voila, it works. Um, so, you know, we sort of hope that that is the future, um, but you never know. And, and uh, I, I think there are some concerns on their side. Um, but, uh, you know, I think with more adoption of something like a lightning address, um, I think they, they would have to at least question it, right? Like, should we have gone this way? Should we go this route? That's, that's how we think of it, at least. Do we need to get Fiat Jaff in the room with the, uh, Twitter, uh, product people and have him do a good, uh, talking to? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, that, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so Ellen URL, um, I uh, I messaged uh, Fiat Jaff after I messaged you, Andre, because I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of friendly with Fiat Jaff, I think. And uh, I was just wanting to get his opinion. And he's like, well, why would you want to know about that, Chaz? You hate you, uh, Ellen URL. Um, well, I don't hate you, Ellen URL. Uh, I, I definitely fall into obsessions where I'm paying attention to Bolt 12 a lot right now. We're talking about any prev out way too much let's say but um i don't i don't really hate anything um i get very skeptical of things so but anyway um so do you think kind of question for both y'all uh, do you think ellen url has kind of reached its kind of ceiling or kind of reached its like not final version but reached the kind of end of its mostly feature set and we're not going to see too much in the future or we're going to see a shit ton of more stuff on it that you know maybe guys can't even imagine right now you're going to see a shit ton more stuff in it that we can't even imagine yet got it okay well easy uh easy answer there i don't think it's that it's that easy like <laughs> getting everybody to agree to implement the same thing is very very hard so we definitely like i have a bunch of crazy plans that I wanted to see happening, but of course it doesn't depend on me. So, so this is a, the challenge with any, you know, protocol and or standard that's being created. It's, you know, you can't just say, you know, this version of LNURL is not working. Let's build a new one. Every single wallet and every single service that has support for it will have to eventually evolve with it. Um, thankfully, LNURL is built in a, you know, here's the base protocols, the four or five base protocols, and then there's additional optional, you know, functionalities and features that, and properties that you can add. Um, but what I meant earlier is that, like, the fact that LNURL lives on a layer on top of Lightning, you could say, um, it can move at a much faster rate than Lightning. Uh, not only is, is Lightning, uh, you know, the actual core protocol, uh, you don't want to truly mess up on the protocol. You don't want to mess around too much on the protocol. You want things to be stable and, and, and work, let's say like that. Um, on a layer above it, you can be more experimental. You can be, uh, uh, slightly more reckless. Remember the Lightning reckless days. Um, so LNURL allows us to experiment with things. Um, and I think what I meant earlier is just we have, you know, LNURL channel, withdraw, pay, and auth. And auth isn't really a, a lightning node thing. It could be used elsewhere. Um, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is there's quite a few more features that we can attempt to iterate and attempt to go through. So recurrence is a big one that everyone's talking about. Allowances is another one. WebSocket support is a big one. And these are things that we can test, iterate. And if they get support, it's similar to lightning address. It's not something that, you know, here's a website, everything is not working all of a sudden every wallet has to support it right so all the wallets have you know, a, major, a large majority have found that having support for sending to a lightning address is an important feature so they've all gone
on and implemented it. So if all the wallets and all the services decide that this new feature is something they want to have support for, they will go out of their way. And if all the users want that features, you know, those developers will, will sort of build for the users. So, um, I just think there's a lot more to be explored and LNUR allows us to iterate uh, at a slight faster rate than something like protocol development, uh, which which has, you know, quite a quite a few more hurdles to go through. So I think that leads me to a kind of interesting question. So Fiat Jaff, uh, the last time you were on here, you were. We were on here with Rusty, um, and obviously Rusty's big thing right now is, you know, offers slash Bolt 12. Um, and so something that I want to make clear, I don't think LN URL and Bolt 12 are mutually exclusive. I think that there are good things that kind of feed into one another. And I think the episode where I had both Fiat Jeff and Rusty together was trying to kind of stoke more of that, of trying to kind of cross pollinate, you know, the the different minds at play here to hopefully, you know, get some more convergence if you could help it. Um, because it seems like Bolt 12 suffers from the same problem, not really, uh, or, or probably far worse than Ellen URL. It's, it seems like Ellen URL is actually pretty good at getting adoption um, and, you know, getting itself out there. Bolt 12 is struggling to find a second implementation that would, um, you know, actually adopt it so, uh, so Rusty can, you know, write it down in the spec. I think we kind of know Fiat Jaff's opinion on Bolt 12, but, you know, we're more than welcome to chime in again on it. But um, do you guys see Bolt 12 and maybe something similar to Lightning Address or Lightning Address itself, uh, you know, making its way into Bolt 12 and maybe your opinion on the future of Bolt 12 slash offers? Just on the C Lightning front, so my understanding is that both LDK and Eclair are have plans at least to implement a version of Bolt 12. Um, so I know that there's still pieces of Bolt 12 being worked out. Uh, and just recently there was a change from vendor to issuer and some changes around the recurrence uh, piece around Bolt 12. But um, that's it's my understanding that there will be a second and, and potentially a third implementation uh, supporting Bolt 12 in the near future. I, I don't know timelines or anything like that. Um, the biggest, you know, the biggest... I guess a hurdle is, is the fact that, um, you could say that, uh, you know, LND, uh, nodes still run the majority of, you know, LND is the software that runs in the majority of the nodes in the network. I think it's an overwhelming majority at this stage. Um, and so you would have to get that feature into LND for it to be widely, uh, you know, usable. If, if Bolt 12 only works with C Lightning, Eclair, uh, and Rust Lightning and LDK, uh, unfortunately that covers only a, a minority uh, of the nodes in the network. And so wallets that you know, any of the current mobile wallets, I'm, I'm talking about like Breeze and, uh, and maybe Moon or Phoenix, et cetera, and SBW, like these wouldn't be able to support it because they don't have a C Lightning backend, right? Um, so it does complicate things a little. And like I was saying earlier, it's tough to make a change like, like Bolt 12. It's just there, there are a lot of hurdles. It's not just here's the software, go and do it. Uh, it needs to be two implementations at least. It has to be merged into the spec. Um, so it is just a much more time consuming and, and, you know, potentially a much bigger effort, uh, period, right? Like, like I was saying, LNURL is a layer above it, so it can be much more highly experimental. I think uh, Bo12 is is very cool, and I think it's like a, a replacement to LNURL LNUR Pay and LNURL Roof Draw that no one talks about when when people when people say. But there's there's that part too on, on Bo12. There's the withdrawal stuff. And I think if, if Bo12 existed since the beginning, LNR Pay and Withdrawal would never have been created. At the same time, I don't think it's the place, like the, the, the core Lightning Network messages shouldn't be the place for arbitrary data to be passed around. And the, the main criticism people make to LNR and they say Bo12 is, is better, uh, there, there are two, like one is privacy stuff and uh, hosting a server or whatever. I think I said the, the truth. And I, I don't think this is solvable by turn, replacing uh, HTTP with lightning messages around the lightning network because that doesn't scale, right? Even, I don't know, 
like you, you want to put all the all the data transmission of everything in the internet today in into the lightning network no right but when when do you do you stop like you you ju you're just gonna send the LNURL like protocol that, that is both 12 around the, the Lightning Network channels, or you're going to send more stuff, or when when do you stop there? In, in my opinion, it should be like just the strictly necessary data to make a payment. And we are already having spam on the network today, and that's already bad. And both 12 is is a softer kind of spam, is a, is a more benign spam, like the the onion messages. But it's just, I think it still qualifies as spam. It wouldn't be spam if you could force people to pay for each each kind of each piece of data transmitted. But then it's a, a totally different protocol, I guess, that we don't have. And, and the other the other thing that people criticize is that this thing that, oh, you have to run an HTTP server. But the entire point of LNURL was always that you're paying to a service or you're drawing for a service. Uh, a service like is, a, is an entity, uh, a, an entity a, that has a website. You're interacting with a website, basically, or with a physical store or something like that. And in that case, that website already has a, like, that, that that provider, that service already has a presence on the internet. It already has a, or is already running an HTTP server. It was never meant to be like a peer-to-peer, -peer, purely peer, purely peer-to-peer -peer protocol that you you're sending money to friends. Uh, that's my understanding, at least. And as I said, I, I don't believe tipping friends is is a thing that a uh, uh, use case that's going to succeed in the future like it's not going to be a big thing big thing is buying bread on the bakery uh, <laughs> and that that's what i want for the lightning network and then the, the bakery has a website and that's it i was just gonna add um what the, the reason why lnurl i completely agree with a few just points uh, the two points that i want to make was the reason why lnurl is is wallets to services um like it, it was built that way for a reason because uh, the main purpose initially was two things. One was opening a channel, right, from someone else. Um, and the other one was the withdraw. You, you there, before LNURL withdraw. Um, so for the, the entire life of Lightning right now, if it wasn't for LNURL withdraw, you wouldn't be able to scan something and receive funds. That would not be possible, right? Um, you would have to have another way to do some you know, complicated key send thing potentially, but that even that uh, is, is not as simple. Um, so uh, I, I do want to point out that the criticism uh, from from on the LNURL side of things usually comes from the LNURL pay side of things. Like, oh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm you know accessing uh, an HTTP server, I'm giving away my IP, and I'm scanning a QR code just to make a payment. I don't need to do this. Um, and and this is the the constant criticism. And then uh, you ask about LNURL withdraw, and no one has a problem with that one. Right. No one has a problem scanning a QR code and receiving funds, regardless if it has the same privacy data leak and all the things relating to LNURL pay. Um, and, and the other point I wanted to make was to reinforce, uh, Fiat Jeff's, uh, point relating to like, wh what is the slippery slope? Uh, sorry, it is a slippery slope when you begin to add general arbitrary data into lightning, into the protocol itself, right? Because it's finished off. So where do you stop? Like, why would we stop at the bolts 12 interaction? Why wouldn't we create hundred more types of interactions and do everything through lightning? Um, and unless we go to a pay per payment flow, um, I think, you know, you completely right to assume that everything is going to be spammed and the network won't function as, as we think it should. And as we want it to, um, so uh, I think Br uh, Roy from breeze just posted, a. Uh, a very good post on this talking about the, I think the way he called it was the Satoshi highway or something along those lines. Um, and you know, lightning can coexist next to current HTTP. Like we don't need to recreate HTTP entirely. Uh, sure. The internet is not the most decentralized as it can be, and we can build towards it, but you don't need to move everything from the internet into lightning. Otherwise, you know, and, and this is the only way that it can succeed. I think that's a very uh, uh, potentially, wrong path to look at. Uh, these are just opinions, you know, we're, we never know what's going to happen. Um, but I, I believe Lightning needs to be an incentivized network in order for there to be, um, you know, actual data 
transitions uh, tra- transmission of that that level. Um, it's just a slippery slope. Uh, in my opinion, it should stay as a payment network and doing what it does best, which is settle HLCs. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question that might make it seem like I'm trying to pit LNURL against Bolt 12, but the the impression that I get that in five years, most likely we, we are not going to be using Bolt 12. We're still going to be using LNURL as like the best like w- way to get all these different features in. Because I guess from from my perspective as a podcast host here, um, my particular bias is I want recurring payments on the Lightning Network directly. I want to be able to build a membership system of some sort, whatever. Um, and so people can be like, you know what? I want to support Lightning Junkies for X amount of time. I want that to be really easy and on the Lightning Network itself, not through some you know, third-party interface, if I could, if I could help it, um, et cetera. I honestly don't care, I guess, at the end of the day, if I have to set up some server, you know, I already have a server for my BTC pay server. Wouldn't it be that hard to add the the pieces for lightning address? I think Andre told me that uh, BTC pay server is getting ready to launch um, a version that has it in there. This Friday, they're releasing it full LNURL and full Lightning address support. You can create, uh, apparently, you can create as many Lightning addresses as you want. And since BTC Pay Server is already a server running on a website, it's like a, a sort of match made in heaven. Uh, you already have an email. You already have an ad, sorry. You already have a domain. Uh, you already have a Lightning node. You already have a Bitcoin node. Everything is all hooked up. Now you have a Lightning address set up. So they're saying this Friday is the release. Um, that's going to end up being in the past by the time we uh, publish Sorry. the show. But, <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I'm just letting the audience know. Um, but I mean, do you see? Like, I, I kind of, you know, mess up my own question there. But do you see Ellen URL being the kind of more the one that's going to be more organically used in a couple of years? Obviously, you guys aren't psychic, so I can't. I'm not going to hold you to any of this. But just your kind of gut feeling at the moment. My view of the future for LNURL Pay was that it would be used in physical shops, physical stores, and apparently no one likes to buy stuff in the, in the physical world anymore, and no no physical shops are using Lightning so far. So that that's like other things were built on top of it, and I think stuff like recurring payments. You say you say you want recurring payments to happen organically, uh, naturally. I don't know w- which word you use it. The, the, the point of, with both both, uh, both uh, Bo12 and LNL pay, if if there's a recursive uh, recurring payments uh, implemented on, on LNL pay, both, in both cases, it will be a process running on your wallet that triggers a new payment every week or every month or something like that. So it, it's not... There's no there's no magic happening on the network itself. Like it's just the network is just a place where the messages get sent. Or in the case of the LNURL, it's HTTP to a server. So I think both both things could work, and it would be very similar. Very similar. Yeah, I I don't know about the future. I think LNURL. I I kind of hope LNURL stands stands out and. Uh, evolves and gets more adopted because I think it's very, very simple to do. To do like anyone can implement that. So just some JSON over HTTP, and it's very open. Anyway, that, that's that's what I think. It's not spamming the Lightning Network. <laughs> that's what I think, and I hope. I guess my take is more along the lines of adoption phases. You know, it's it's a matter of like. A, at a certain point, uh, will LNURL and its many sub protocols, uh, and I guess tangentially including Lightning Address, will they reach escape velocity? Right. Let's assume something like, uh, 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 you know, let's say uh, a company, a platform. I don't know if Twitter is going to be the one, but let's say a company like Twitter were to introduce Lightning Address. Right. Uh, now you're talking about a, a, a company that has 300 million active users. If a tiny chunk of those begin to use Lightning Address, 
um, that's that's sizable, right? That's a big chunk of users that are introduced to this new technology. Um, now, it could be that that doesn't happen, and it could be that that takes longer, and, and LNUR continues the adoption velocity that it's seen now. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe it just remains that way. And all of a sudden, bolts 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 come in and, you know, just completely change the dynamics because it's, you know, that much better. Um, and, and I think it's a matter of reaching scape velocity in terms of adoption. If all the wallets are involved and if all the services are involved, it's quite a, quite a challenge to intru- to switch, right? To from this software, to, from this protocol to a different protocol. Now, um, there, there's always the, the discussion around, like, from a product perspective, um, when, when you're expecting to change user behavior, uh, really what's, what the, the, I guess the, the understanding is that the behavior needs to provide 10 to 100x improvement in some facets, right? If, if, if it's the same, uh, or worse, the user will not do that. And an example is going to the shop down the street and tapping your Apple Watch on the, on the POS system and like, okay, you paid. Right. That experience is faster and better than opening your wallet, uh, opening your phone, clicking the wallet, swiping to the right, scanning the QR code, pressing confirm. You know, like that is too many clicks in too many seconds. Um, so, you know, making real life payments with lightning is not yet a better user experience um, from the developer side. If all of a sudden bolts 12, 13, 14 and et cetera uh, can replace LNURL and they provide 10x to 100x improvement in development flow or development experience or in, you know, features to be able to be provided to the end users, uh, then it will overtake that. Right. And, and it may take some time, but it, it will do that because it's simply better. Um, so I think it's those two points that that, that sort of really uh, come to tone into if, if LNUR is so widely uh, adopted, I think it's tough to say that it'll get displaced. But if it, if another protocol is that much better, then you know the new one will will reign supreme eventually. Uh, it's just a matter of timeline. So one thing that I'd like to add uh, is that LNUR has has a bunch of crazy features that. People don't 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 quite know, like that you can interact with a service f- directly from your wallet. Like you can get a code from from the service. You can you can send up you can send your data to the service somehow. Uh, and I think that's that's a new thing that no one is is very used to. And if more more people start integrating it in your in its full cap- capabilities in, in their services i think that would be a very cool uh, that that will mean there are cool services being implemented that use satoshis and I think that would be a, a bright future i'm not sure about this apple pay tap your watch because i think that's impossible to do in a decentralized way so I think people will settle for less less fancy experiences if they uh, if they can use Bitcoin instead of shitty whatever USD crap. I, I would agree. I'd agree. Um, I, I guess my point there was just saying that um, I don't think we're going to replace the scanning, and touching your your Apple Watch on the payment. Uh, that's not the point. It's just that the experience of tapping it is better than having to scan a QR code and pay for it. Um, so real, real life payments over lightning. Um, I think there's still, you know, it's, it's comparable. Let's say like that internet and virtual worlds and in game and in app payments over lightning is a hundred million times better and faster than using credit cards, right? Like you don't have to type 16 numbers. You don't have to give all that information away. You scan a QR code and you pay. So it, it's currently shining really brightly online. Uh, and in virtual environments, um, more than it is in a real world environment. Uh, but maybe we'll, you know, hopefully very soon we'll get there, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Do you guys have any thoughts on how we would get there since you guys bring it up? How, how would we do in-person Lightning Network transactions? Um, one idea that I'm pulling out of my ass here is um, I remember a Bitcoin wallet uh, like years ago that had some kind of location-based payment system where like... It would it would know if you had a lightning wallet somehow. I'm sure that's not the greatest thing that your phone is telling everyone that you have a lightning wallet. But um, I don't know, some kind of thing that knows that you're there and you can just do a minimal amount of work to transmit the funds from A to B. I don't know. Is that complete nonsense? Wasn't there a video 
recently from the, uh, I think ARC BTC, Ben ARC was the one that posted it. I'm not sure, Parallelini Polys, I forget, I believe that's the name of the company. Um, they did, I think my understanding is what they did is the POS system had a scanner and it was expecting, it was an LNURL pay QR code. It was NFC. It was sure, but it was NFC. Sorry, you were right. It was NFC, but what what the what the card or the the, the fob was giving to the POS system was actually an LNURL withdraw QR code content. So like here's contents to withdraw from my service provider. Um, and I thought that was a, a, li a little hacky. I'm not sure. It, it was a conference, I guess. I think, and and they had an internal account system. And you, I think you deposited something when you when you enter, they credit your account and you got one of the NFC cards and then you just tap the NFC card in other, like to buy stuff, I think. I think that worked very, very nicely. It was all internal custodial? It was all internal. I think it works quite nicely in a closed environment. You, you could do that on a decentralized environment, but then you would have machines stealing you all your money like you buy something for one dollar and they they take a hundred dollars <laughs> yeah that's what would happen um i'm not sure you know i think uh, you know something that is also criticized on the lightning address side is like great you don't need qr codes anymore but you know uh, akin to non-custodial mobile wallets who can't provide a lightning address because that is not like they can't it's physically not something that they should even provide maybe like that's not an offering of theirs um, because it requires a server right next to it so um, one of the one of the criticisms I guess is okay QR codes are great because they're sovereign right the QR code from your wallet and my wallet and every single one of our wallets for a lightning invoice is the same and every one of us understands it and if you remove the QR code you're now saying that only certain wallets can send to this address or only certain wallets can interact with you so you're sort of adding that layer there um, so I, I think in the real world, QR codes are great for certain purposes, um, but when it comes to making payments at scale, um, I'm not entirely sure if they're the best fit. I think NFC and, and that could be much more of the future that we want. Um, but again, the, the QR code contents can be shared through NFC, right? So you don't need the physical looking QR code component. You can just share the contents of that through, through a, a near feud communication protocol. Um, I think that's the way to move towards a, a more seamless lightning experience in the real world. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the whole camera scanning QR code scales forever and ever. Like right now during COVID, we saw QR codes explode, but for very static purposes, like there's a QR code printed for you to open the menu of the restaurant, right? Yeah, because they're not, they have no imagination and they don't use lightning. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. Oh, I think we we can we can stay here and try to think about stuff like geolocation stuff and whatever. But then McDonald's on El Salvador will use a system where they print a paper with a QR code and you scan the QR code and you go to a web page on your phone and then you click to get an invoice. <laughs> so we may invent the very best system, but in the end, McDonald's will decide maybe. I hope not. Yeah, that is a pretty terrible setup, like giving you a receipt, open note or something, right? Um, yeah, that's not the greatest. But um, as far as LNURL and maybe a Lightning Address goes, what do you see as being the long-term vision for Lightning Address? I think uh, you have these these providers like Vimo. I don't know. I don't have these things here in Brazil, but Vimo, Cash App, whatever, that you can send money to friends by name. Like you, you type your the username of the pe the person. I think I guess that that's how it works, and you can send money. I I think people use these things. I have no idea, but Lightning Address is already an improvement over that that you can send to any provider. And that's that's one thing that I think is very good. And the other thing that I want to see is stuff like the LNUR slash pay dot me that I, I cited uh, slash I don't know the name of these symbols. Dash. Dash. <laughs> okay. So using the lighting addresses to buy stuff like you can you maybe 
if you buy a pizza every week for some place some place you have like the pizza at the pizza place.com or and that's saved on your phone and then you just click on that and something like that some some experience that where you can just repeat a, a previous payment to buy another stuff and and like lightning addresses written on walls that can like you can pay to that to do different kind of stuff like open like get a, a food from the machine or something like that yeah i would i would second those two thoughts uh the first one being like interoperability across providers um you know there's plenty of exchanges out there there are plenty of neobanks fintechs uh you know and and and, and even companies that are bitcoin forward and, and you know bitcoin based that have accounting system but aren't actually wallets or providers like a great example is bitrefill they just rolled out lightning address support um the, you know the lightning the lightning account in bitrefill is not like a mobile wallet that you take and do everything with it but all of a sudden now you have this address that you can enter anywhere and you know folks can send you money uh, regardless if it's a tip or not, and it goes directly into you know bit refill, and you can spend those funds on the many hundreds of products they have. Um, so I think uh, you know I, I would have to create an invoice over there. I'd have to scan it from my wallet, and and that flow is already great. It's better than the current flow that Fear Jeff was saying, like Venmo, Cash App, your bank, Chase. Like you can't send money across those. They have to create their own. Uh, they're speaking the same dollar currency but you can't send the funds from one to the other right you can't type something like at cash app and, and send it from venmo um and now with lightning address i can send from zebedee to bit refill and bit refill to zebedee and zebedee to lntx bot and back to coin os and like and soon back to your own btc pay server that you host and all of that is, is interoperable because they all sort of follow the same open standard um so that's the first point um, I guess the second point is uh, that I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on what Fear Jeff was saying. Um, Blixt does this very well right now, uh, where whenever you interact with a lightning address, it essentially allows you to save it to a, a friend's a contacts page kind of thing. Um, and similarly to how you have a contacts of your email addresses and similarly to how you have a contacts of your friends on your phone, it would be great to have an additional field for your a lightning address, right? And so um, if I interact with your Jeff multiple times, um, I can just like, when I start typing Fiat Jeff, uh, it can already auto complete, you know, like, do you want to use their lightning address? And then great, it auto complete. And so you can now have a, a running list of folks' addresses uh, and you, and you eventually create this, uh, uh, this friends contact list in the lightning network side of things. And so uh, the same way you have emails and you have your email contacts, you can now have lightning in your lightning contacts and you can send back and forth uh, without needing to, Hey, create an invoice and send it to me so I can send you 500 sats, right? You can just send it directly. Um, and I think it, that that piece is very powerful. And I, and I don't think we've seen uh, the full, you know, capabilities and sort of fruition that that can, can lead. Imagine if all the wallets had something like that. Um, you know, I'm imagining a scenario where I want to send from Zebedee to BitRefill and I can link my account to there because I can just type the address and I click a button that says, you know, transfer and boom, it just transfers. And because it's lightning and because, you know, we're both liquid and have managed nodes, it just works and it settles instantly. And then all of a sudden I can spend it. Um, so I think that is something that we're trying to do. And then the third point, which is a technicality, but, um, because of the way LNUL is set up, LNUL Pay is set up, uh, there's the LUD 18, and now I'm getting very technical, maybe. Uh, there's a LUD 18, which aims to uh, pass on whenever you make a payment to a Lightning address. Uh, if you are uh, you know, a provider of a Lightning address as well, it would send that information across. So if I'm making a payment to Chaz at lightningjunkies.com, it would say that you, on your side, would say you've received a payment from Andre at zbd.gg. Right. So it's sort of the attribution phase. Um, it is not uh, meant to be a cryptographic sort of, uh, uh, you know, there's no way to fake it. Uh, similar to emails, you can spoof the sender. Right. It's not meant to be like a, a, a true uh, who is sending the payment, but is, it is an identifier. So I know uh, in, in the case of the tipping, I know that Andre tipped me five sats and I know that Fiat Jaff tipped me five sats instead of just saying I've received a payment for five sats. Right. Um, so that that piece is also very exciting. And I think combining that with the contacts would be very powerful. 
the, the same LUT18, they also has a way to send the an LNO of key and signature. So that's cryptography proven, but that is not a name, a readable name. But it can be useful too if you want, like, if you buy something by scanning a QR code on the street. Like the, the website that is selling you that, they, they also get your LNO of key. So you can log in later and do something with that. Other, other use cases on related to this. Well, on the point I, I mentioned before about buying a pizza, you can do that today. Not, not quite a pizza, but you can send money to chickens on Polo, Polo Feed. There's a <laughs> lightning address, Polo Feed at polofeed.com. If you send money there, you feed chickens, not with pizza. It's pretty funny. I love it. But yeah, so that there were some kind of good things, some you know things to look forward to, things that uh, Lightning Address already kind of has that um, not a lot of not a lot of other things kind of offer. Um, but um, I guess I wanted to examine the flip side of things. Um, what is negative about Lightning Address? What are the pitfalls? Um, is there, you know, how do you guys cook the the, the, uh, the uh, sausage here? You know, what's the, uh, the ugly insides? Tell me about it, please. In a perfect world, uh, Lightning wouldn't have the requirement of always being online in order to receive payments. Um, in a perfect world, you would have a lightning node in your phone and it would be, you know, off or closed and it would be in your pocket and you could still receive payments non-custodially and you own the node and you own the keys and everything. Um, that is not the case, right? In lightning, you have to be online. If you're not online, it doesn't work. So you could open your mobile node on your phone, request an invoice, and this, you know, and you send it to someone to make a payment. If you close your phone, there's a chance that, that payment will never arrive. Um, and if you're considering injecting lightning into everything or infusing, I may make a shill here, infusing lightning uh, into everything and into every game, into every app, into every service uh, in the future, um, you know, it's it's kind of tricky uh, because Lightning Address does not, so, you know, it, let me rephrase. They're, all of the all of the current wallets, majority of the current wallets support sending to a Lightning Address. But we talked about this earlier. Receiving is a different matter, right? Um, so one of the downsides, and, and not to suggest that it's a downside of LNURL Pay because it was always a, a, a known. A requirement that LNURL requires an HTTP server uh, on the on the service side. That was always a requirement. So it's not like it was a new thing, but in an ideal world, it would also serve for non-custodial wallets and non-custodial nodes, uh, and you wouldn't need that information and then that server. Um, but because of the way Lightning works, you have to have a node online. Um, and so I think that is one of the, the negatives. Um, but only, only been, it's only a negative if you if you're thinking entirely on the you know self sovereign and non custodial like the entire way on that side of the spectrum um, that could be seen as a potential negative. Um, so I think the adoption of Lightning Address receiving uh, will likely get a lot more support from things like you know getting it on BTC Pay server, getting it on Umbral and other home node you know environments. Um, because a lot of mob a lot of mobile wallets will not be able to provide that because it is not something that they they want or can or you know potentially even should provide. It's just not. It's a different offering. Like I was saying earlier, it's a completely different offering with different trade offs. Um, so I don't know. Maybe that's a, a downside. Uh, some people don't like that it's JSON. I, I like JSON. It's used everywhere in the world, basically. What should be instead of JSON? XML <laughs> or <laughs> Just let's do XML, yeah. God no. Oh my my downside is like the the need for domain names. I, as much as domain names are a good thing, I think they work very well. They are very very centralized infrastructure. Like I can it 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 controls everything. It can do very bad things since it owns it basically owns all domain names. I think in the ideal world, we would have some kind of decentralized domain domain name system. That is not a shitcoin. I think I, I have a plan that I'm, I don't know if it will work, but for a domain name system on a space chain that will 
hopefully fix a bunch of these problems, then get rid of certificate authorities and ICAM. And maybe if it works, I'll be I'll be killed by 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 these <laughs> vampire people. But, but yeah, I think Chaz is not doing a good work because we should have any prevot working right now, so I could finish oh. my implementation. I didn't realize it was all on my head to get all this. Uh, <laughs> hey, everybody, let's uh, get any prev out going. Let's go. Uh, is everyone listening? OK, I don't know. You got it, coach. I'm on it. You got it. <laughs> all right. Well, um, those are some weaknesses there. Um, and I think I have my uh, last question here. We're kind of wrapping it up here. Um, kind of going a little bit more broad so it doesn't have to be just LNURL or just Lightning address here. It could be anything across Bitcoin or Lightning. Um, what do you think is currently missing? Zebedee came in and added a fair amount of stuff. LNURL came in and added a fair amount of stuff. What else is missing? What else could some um, uh, adventurous or curious person that's listening to this podcast, what's some little piece of the ecosystem that they could take on and work on and feel, you know, feel like they're making a difference in the Bitcoin Lightning uh, world? Wow. You should have asked this before to give us time to think. <gasps> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is a big one. I've been I've been laughing here because I'm like that's the biggest question of the of the podcast. Um, Fear, Fear Jeff always has ideas, so I'm, I'll let him take first. I'm thinking. <laughs> well, my my thing is like I think there's a bunch of services that exist that uh, that are provided today with. <laughs> with fiat money and I think they could be just replicated by someone and like useful things like not toys that exist to play with lightning but useful services that then people that have a, a lot of Bitcoin can can use. This is one thing but I, I don't know if this is the the answer I just, just thought that. Another thing is like a more abstract idea is like there's a bunch of services that could like that could work that could exist, uh, but they don't exist today in the in the fiat system because you can't pay, you can't send money to people on the internet, right? It's impossible. You can only set up a company and then you receive money via via credit cards, and you can't you can't pay the users back. So I think there's a ton of experiences that involve the user get receiving money and also paying money depending on, on whatever the, the action is that's being performed. For example, uh, the one one example that exists in the field system is the ad ads network, like the Google Google Ads, whatever it's called today. That you you are you are you have a website that has a handful of people visiting it and Google pay, pays you money for that. And it like it's I had a website with ads uh, some time ago and it was very terrible because I couldn't get paid. I, I had to wait until I had a hundred dollars on the account and then they sent that to to my Brazilian bank account from the US. Then the Brazilian bank took like sixty <laughs> percent. So it was or horrible and, and very bad. So this kind of thing, and uh, I think that's there. There are many possibilities there. Yeah, that sounds horrible, man. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know that I have something uh, specific in, in mind. I think the general theme of what I've been thinking is just uh, you know what is the experience of a new user that's coming into the Lightning world. And, uh, you know, you can go to Lightning Network stores and, and see some stuff, but a lot of it is, is toys, right? That we, you were saying, uh, it's like small little websites that do one thing here and one thing there. Um, you have full blown companies now building on Lightning, which includes Zebedee. Um, but uh, I think what, what's interesting is, you know, great. I'm, I'm onboarded into Lightning. I have sats. Like, what do I do with it? Right. What, what do I do? Um, there's plenty of ways of earning sats these days. 
uh, whether you're playing Counter Strike on Zebedee, whether you're, uh, you know, using your card and, and spinning the wheel on Fold, or uh, you know, doing cash backs on on uh, uh, rewards and, and bit refill, etc. Um, there's plenty of ways of earning Sats and stacking Sats, but there's not many ways of, you know, using your Sats on the Lightning Network. Um, and I hope that uh, you know more developers entering the space and, and entrepreneurs, um, you know, try and, and solve that circular economy piece where you know the, the the main ask there is not for you to earn Sats in the service or the product; it's it's to spend Sats um, because that's really the piece that's that's missing. You know, uh, services that that see the full circular economy they they receive it and then you, other users receive it and, and send it and receive it. Um, so I hope that app developers, game game developers that want to enter this world and provide new games, you know, talk to us, uh, but also get involved and, and build games on it because I think we're still uh, far away from, uh, you know, a true circular lightning economy and far away from someone being onboarded and just having a plethora of services and games and apps and places to use, uh, to join, to participate. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of initiatives on the podcasting front, uh, you know, and there's a lot of initiatives on the gaming front, uh, and of course trading. But trading is not actually using money; it's just it's trading. Um, so I'd love to see more commerce, um, you know, whether it's real life or, or online, um, and just ways of spending uh, your sats in creative ways and, and uh, potentially in, in novel applications, like Fiatjaf was saying, uh, just just you know things that are unable to be done in the current dollar-denominated fiat world. Um, you know, I, th I think that's sort of my message there. So uh, you reminded me that one of one example of of what I was talking about is uh, these games that you they force you to see ads and then they promise to pay you some dollars after a year of ads. So <laughs> this kind of thing, I think it doesn't work. I I, I'm not, I don't have an experience with that, but I think it doesn't work very well in the fiat uh, scheme and this kind of stuff and also those games where you can buy clothes for your character i think you can just buy the clothes but to sell them to trade them trade these clothes with other players i think it's very very hard because you can't get money out of of the game so these are some of the easy easy wins like easy things that can be just turn it like just use satoshis and everybody wins on, on, on these. Stay, stay tuned because there are games coming out with these exact mechanics that Fiat Jeff talked about in the coming month. Amazing. All right. So that's pretty much it. Um, did we miss anything on Ellen URL or Lightning address that you would like to hit before we close out the show here? Uh, not personally, I think I would just encourage people that are interested or, you know, they don't really know what it is, go to lightningaddress.com and check it out. There's a flavor for, for each and every person. If it is for you, great. If it isn't, you know, that's fine. Um, like I said, it serves some use cases. It's, it doesn't serve all of them. Um, and you can self-host it. You can use a bridge server. You, you can use an a infrastructure provider. Um, and just, just play with it. See if it's something you're interested in. Um, because it's so easy to create an account on something like Zebedee, you can create the account, test it, and if you don't like it, you don't have to use the, the Lightning address, right? Um, but at least try it out. It's a new development, and I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think I spoke too much. <laughs> I don't think that's the case, man. <laughs> uh, like, I was actually trying to, I was actually talking to to Cat about getting you on more podcasts. So, you know, who knows if that's true? But um, if you guys don't have anything else, uh, uh, could you guys let the listeners know how they can find you on the uh, interwebs? Oh, they can listen to our, our podcast. We have a podcast that's oh, yeah. soon going to be much bigger than Lightning Junkies with our, our 10 <laughs> listeners. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so I think we have a total of 12 listeners now. We've <laughs> done, we have done four episodes and we have maybe 13 listeners. So, uh, no, it's called it's called Lightning Tidbits. And honestly, it's uh, Fiatraf and I just talk a lot about Lightning in general on a daily basis. And so we figured we would record um, some of these conversations and so uh, every week fake, we try right? it's fake what what do you mean it's fake like we just we, we rehearse everything and use <laughs> no we don't we definitely don't rehearse anything <laughs> uh, 
Um, we ju- we just get together and we pick three uh, links or things we want to talk about, and we just hash it out and have a discussion. Um, if you're a lightning enthusiast and developer or around this this world of nodes and lightning this and lightning that it may be interesting for you so you can join the other 13 people listening to our podcast um but yeah uh, i'm i'm andre nevis on twitter and zebedee is zebedee.io um it's not hard there's a lot of e's in the middle there but it's not hard um and lightningaddress.com is where you go to learn more about about the protocol Fear Jeff is, is Fear Jeff everywhere, aren't you? Yes. Even even FearJeff.com. Yeah, uh, on my soon to come the uh, decentralized domain name system, I will hard code Fear Jeff there as the first dot name. <laughs> FearJeff.xyz, right? No, the idea is that would no. be just one name. Like no no uh TLDs. <laughs> It's just like Got handshake, it. isn't it? Just, just the uh, yeah. Okay, interesting. Alrighty. Well, I think that we have reached the end of the show here. We're, we're just at the hour and 30 minute mark. So I, I want to go ahead and uh, thank both you guys for joining me on the Lightning Junkies podcast here. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for having us, Chess. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure. Sorry for my bad English. <laughs> No one, no one thinks you have bad English. I think everyone can understand you fine, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's stand, standard, standard stuff. I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Alrighty. Well, um, that's the end of the show. I'll catch you, everybody, later. It's a weird way to end it, but I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna do it that way. Boom! That was the 52nd episode of the Lightning Junkies podcast. I hope you took something away from this episode. I definitely feel like Lightning Address was a good topic for us to cover. It's going to become increasingly relevant as time goes on. Hopefully exchanges add this shit. Seeing as Lightning Address has gotten a lot of adoption very quickly, it stands to reason this trend will continue. Just a quick reminder here at the end that if you'd like to support us, you you can listen to us on Breeze Wallet. Don't forget about Fountain. That's also a very good option. Or any of the other apps you can find at newpodcastapps.com. You could also support us and our supporters at lightningjunkies.net forward slash support. Well, that's all we have here today at the Lightning Junkies podcast. Why don't you say bye to them, Kat? Bye, guys. I'll see you on the Lightning Network. <laughs> <laughs>